717. It's been five weeks since we've done a YouTube video. We have some good questions from this last week's sermon, which was on Jeremiah chapter 7 and the famous temple sermon by Jeremiah, as it's referred to, the nation of Israel, in particular the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, is convinced nothing will happen that Jeremiah has been prophesying because the temple's there, almost like a divine rabbit foot, uh, rabbit's foot, as long as the temple was there, nothing bad would ever happen, like a good luck charm. And Jeremiah is quite surprised by this assertion of confidence there. And uh, so one of the questions this week is, do I think that part of the confidence was based on the promises given at the temple dedication? I suppose by the question the person means the original temple dedication that Solomon was involved in, as described in, uh, in the book of First Kings, um, and uh, also the question of the reinstituting of that through Hezekiah. And the answer is yes, I, pro I do think that there's probably a lot of hope built there. But even in Solomon's dedication, if you remember from the text, there's a great warning to Solomon. Hey, if you'll be humble and follow me and not be involved in idolatry around here, you can, you can stay in this place. Israel will be able to worship in this place. But if you get involved in idolatry and your hearts wander away from me, and, uh, this temple even itself will be removed from you. Remember Solomon's humble gathering before the Lord. In fact, God so uh, consecrates the place that he shows up in such power that the people are driven from the temple in fear of his uh, Shekinah glory, the gathering of the glory of God in that one place. And they offer these sacrifices in a real time of dedication. But even in there, there was a warning. And Solomon in his own lifetime began to break away against the very warnings God had given them. In many ways, their confidence probably does come from some of those things. Ironically, their confidence should have been uh, shaken greatly by what they saw around them being so inconsistent with what God had told them in that original dedication. So I do think that's probably right. That original dedication was such a glorious moment. I also think the restoration during Hezekiah's day would have built some additional confidence, but um, there's enough warnings in Scripture that they should have known better than that, and so should we, than to put our confidence in some kind of earthly building our religious expression where our hearts aren't engaged in humility before God and grace towards others. Question number two is related to that because one of the things that caused such trouble for Israel is the sacrificing of their own babies to the Asherah and the uh, Baal in acts of idolatrous worship. And the question uh, is, does modern day uh, issues of things like abortion follow that. And I would say there are some parallels, but however, one thing about that ancient practice is there really was a belief that by offering up your newborn child into the fire, and this, I, I mean, it's really graphic and I hate that, but it's a reality for Canaan during that time. The thought was that the Bel or Asherah would then water your crops that year and it was usually involved with some sexual immorality. So it's a very bizarre practice, but apparently practice that the cries of the baby along with uh, associating with temple prostitute, that that somehow pleased the bell or the Asherah and he would therefore water your crops. So it's not quite the same. I get why someone might draw some parallels there, but there's a lot of... Uh, uh, there's a lot of ritualistic stuff involved in this and superstition involved in this. So I think you could see some parallels that we should be very careful about not valuing human life and not just uh, taking whatever means available to us uh, to not value human life. We've got to be really careful about those things. We should, I think, since all people have been made in God's image, be careful about defending the basic sanctity of human life. But I do think, uh, so there's probably some parallels there. But there is a totally different motives. In modern day issues of abortion and euthanasia, they're complicated and they draw a lot of different reasons and motives. And um, it's not quite as simple or clean as the, in terms of reasons as this Bill and Asher worship were. There, it's very simple. That's the idolatry of wanting a new crop of, uh, for the new harvest. All right, number three. Um, 
I know in my heart that uh, I want the Lord to have first place, but I, how do I keep myself from drifting away and allowing it to become just external religion? And that is a real challenge. It's a challenge for me every single day. I think there's a few things I would recommend. Number one is this, always view this as a relationship with God, not as a religion for man or for people. This is a challenge because we do a lot of religious things externally to impress other people. It's what Jesus challenged the most in his public ministry, was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees doing all these religious external things so everyone else would think highly of them. So I think primarily the way to do this is to constantly check our motives. Is this about me knowing God, loving God, honoring God, or is this about people thinking highly of me or me thinking highly of myself? And I think it's a motive issue. So we just constantly, to avoid the temptation of uh, Jeremiah's day, of the temple of the Lord, and we got all this external religion, but the heart is not in it, that the issue was that they weren't interested in a relationship with the God that made them. They were interested in keeping their life as, as uh, beneficial to them as it could be without having to encounter their hearts with God himself. And so... Make sure constantly to be asking this question. Is this about me knowing God, about me experiencing Him, about me honoring Him? Or is this, this issue about me trying to impress my wife, my kids, my family uh, in general, or the church or co-workers or something like that? So constantly checking our motives is the way to make sure this isn't just external religion. So those first three questions are all very closely related to that. Um, the next two have to do with Roman Catholicism. And uh, I, I will say, I don't, I don't know, I didn't grow up Roman Catholic, so this is hard for me to answer specifically, but um, I, I had mentioned something about at Nagaland that at the Catholic Church there, there's a large crucifix of Jesus in the main area in the church. And the question is, does this constitute idolatry uh, that is warned in the uh, Ten Commandments and even in the New Testament? And the answer to that is, there's always a risk, even within religious expression, of taking an object and making it the object of worship. Just like the temple, I'm supposing the reason this person has asked this is the temple of the Lord sermon in Jeremiah 7. What had happened is the temple of God had actually become an idol to the people and it had become as important or more than God himself. So because of that, anything can become an idol. Your car, your house, your kids. Uh, so... A statue of Jesus as artwork can draw our attention upward to God himself and his work. A statue of, uh, you know, so, some other painting or any other artwork. The building itself, like a stunning cathedral, could draw our attention. I, I was at the Notre Dame in Paris, and, and it's a stunning building. It draws your attention to incredible artwork, but it could become an end to itself. 16th century artwork could become the primary focus of the reason for going there and not the worship of God. So the answer is in Roman Catholicism and in Baptist life, and really in all walks of life, artwork and expressions of artwork and expressions of honoring God's creation and his work in history can be helpful. Israel had all kinds of things as part of temple worship and tabernacle worship that were supposed to point to God. But we should always be cautious that those things are not dry, actually literally drawing our attention away from God himself and onto the object. So I think that's what I would suggest with those kinds of things. Imagery, artwork within the Roman Catholicism and Baptist life or whatever you want to say uh, can be beneficial if they draw our attention to God himself. But they cannot become an end to themselves where that is our final expression. All right, so that's a few questions from this week. Hope to see you Sunday night.